We're here at Ubisoft Toronto and we'll be sitting down with some of the team working on the Splinter Cell remake, as well as hearing from some special guests. We'll discuss what made Splinter Cell a pioneer in the industry, some of our favorite memories and moments, and we'll talk a bit about what's next for the franchise. So we're here at Ubisoft Toronto's uh, Performance Capture Studio. Can you guys believe that it's been 20 years since the original Splinter Cell came out uh, way back in 2002? It makes me feel a little bit old, but that's okay. I think it's, uh, it's a good memory to have of a great franchise. So maybe we can just talk a little bit about some of our memories of it and where we were when we first experienced you know, Sam Fisher and Splinter Cell way back. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was the first Splinter Cell, the original. 20 years ago, I was still in high school, still had a full head of hair, and at the time, uh, broadband internet was not ubiquitous like it is now, so we would get our games on demo discs, which you would have attached to magazines, and I remember popping that into my PC, and even though it ran a bit like a slideshow, I played through it like four or five times, and it wasn't until I played it on my friend's Xbox that I truly understood what a technical marvel that game was. The lighting, the shadows, the animations, everything about it blew my mind and it's, it's been stuck in there ever since and I totally love the franchise now. It was amazing to see what Spencer Cell was doing at the time compared to other games. Like that dynamic lighting, like just being able to shoot the lights, creating your own dark spaces, your shadows, like recreating the space for how you wanted to play. Like that was the thing that I thought was really different from the other games that came out at the same time that are also focusing on, on stealth gameplay. You could solve the problems kind of, you know, dynamically as you wished and... and right, yeah. in your own way. Yeah. yeah. I also started with the original Splinter Cell, right? On the Xbox with the Duke controller, big beefy controller in my hands. But what stood out to me was more the gameplay. It was this action-adventure game where you were playing as, you know, this stealth spy style guy, but unlike other games in the genre, you didn't just have your gun out all the time. You weren't just coming up to every enemy, every obstacle, shooting them in the head. It instead was about stealth. It was about going around enemies. It was about watching a situation, a very simple situation, figuring out how am I gonna get past this without them seeing me. That was so different. Yeah, I think for me, I came into the franchise a little bit later. Um, I, I started with Chaos Theory, and I remember, you know, it got recommended to me by a friend. He said, you need to check this game out. And I um, first got into that, that level with the lighthouse and the storm, and you had the, the rain coming down and the, the thunder and lightning, and you were sneaking from corner to corner. And, you know, you had that kind of soundtrack by Emon Tobin playing over the top of it. It was super memorable as this experience all together with the, you know, the different kind of shadow gameplay. You went down into the, the underground where the guy was being tortured with the kind of the, the backlit, like shadow of the, you know, the, the experience that was happening and I just remember coming away from that feeling that the atmosphere had just been nailed and it kind of hooked me in ever since. I cannot believe that the Splinter Cell series is 20 years old. This is a game that for many redefined the third person stealth action genre. You know one of my favorite points was that Splinter Cell was an original Xbox exclusive. When the original Splinter Cell released in 2002, it raised the technical bar from the lighting, which was some of the best we've seen up until that point, to the cutting edge graphics. For me, the original set the scene for one of my favorite entries in the franchise, Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Pandora Tamar, because that kicked off an entirely new part of the series, multiplayer. This is the game that really helped people understand the vision that we had for a brand new service called Xbox Live. Some of the press called it the single best reason to get online. This was a huge leap forward in the industry. So let's talk about Sam Fisher, the person at the heart of the franchise. He's not your typical kind of gung-ho, bravado-filled hero. He's got more depth than that. Um, he's got a lot more kind of warmth to him. He's got a wit and a charm and a conscience, and you know he can make his own decisions on the battlefield. He's you know not someone that's just kind of you know coldly murdering everyone. He's got these these kind of qualities to him that you know really resonate with people. Just pulled up Celestinia's last dry dock report for the Maria Narcissa. They have a newly installed central alarm system. Don't tell me, three alarms and the mission is over. Of course not. This is no video game, Fisher. But you don't want the whole place alerted to your presence. Keep it under control. In the original trilogy, Sam has a very unique personality, right? He, he is witty, he is sarcastic, 
but he's also an elite operator still, right? And then in the later games, he goes through personal loss, and that whole storyline is very carefully interwoven with the narrative of those uh, those extra games. So it's a, an evolving story with Sam Fisher. Dad? Sarah. 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 I thought you were dead. They told me you were dead. Sarah, I'm sorry. But if I hear that Black Arrow radio chatter right, we are out of time. I'll let you sit next to him, but we gotta go. So that really shows how human like Sam is, right? This even comes down to the way that in gameplay he interacts with his enemies. One of the unique things about Splinter Cell is that rather than just shoot every enemy you come up to, he can also talk to them. You can take an enemy in a grab and interrogate them to get information. Hi there. Hi. What's the door code? Two. Eight, four, six, nine. It was a pleasure working with you. Likewise. And while he's doing it, he'll crack a joke. Like exactly. A joke, yeah. He's not a monster. He's not here to say, I'm going to kill you. But he's treating them as just enemies on the other side of the battlefield. I like that he has very strong morals, right? Like he's not reveling in death. He is actually showing respect to the, the, the fellow soldiers, but on the other side. There was this level in Splinter Cell Chaos Theory. You're in Seoul, this war torn, and there's this US plane that has crashed, and Sam's objective is to get the data out of the plane. But Sam's like, some of the pilots are still here. Let me get the pilots to safety first. I'm telling you what the player can choose as Sam to pull the bodies out of the wreckage and get them away from the bombing zone. Lambert's like, do your mission, but Sam's like, how do me? Yeah, Sam gets the order, but Sam also makes the decision what he what he does with the order. And in, in that same vein, the player is making that choice. That's, again, the player agency. They are in control. Sam Fisher is like such a plain name, uh, but everyone knows who he is, right? Like you associate him very closely with Splinter Cell. Uh, you know that's the guy. And then what's kind of cool is he you think of him as a spy, right? He's a covert operative. Uh, he's doing things in a shadow and sneaking around. Everything about the way he talks, uh, the way he talks about his missions and then the way he tackles the missions, the way he talks to his other team members, the way he moves around the world, everything just felt ultra realistic. So the original game did some incredible things with technology to really push the immersion of the world that you were in and it made it feel like it was a living, breathing kind of, you know, something bigger than just a, a level space or a, you know, a corridor or something like that. You know, it had this breakable glass technology that was reasonably kind of new and exciting at the time. Uh, the cloth physics, when you went through those and they kind of moved and flapped around in the breeze as you were kind of, you know, sneaking through all that kind of stuff. We had the, the fish tank physics, the famous fish, fish tanks. Tank. You could shoot the fish tank and the, you know, the water would actually you know, lower down to the point where you shot. And at the time that was kind of you know, super cool and, and you know, never really been seen before. And obviously the lighting, the shadow, all of that tech is, is absolutely integral and important to you know, a stealth-based game. Um, and yeah, it was pretty, pretty fundamental at the time. No one really did dynamic lighting in that way, in the same way that Splinter Cell did. Traditionally, you would use a baked light map or shadow map, which was baked into the environment. But when Splinter Cell did it, it was truly dynamic. You could shoot out almost all the lights and it would be pitch black. And it would really make you have to use the gadgets that Sam's got, like the night vision goggles and things like that. Right, Sam is operating in the shadows. The world is moving despite his presence. And a lot of this was really shown off in the second level of uh, the original Splinter Cell, the police station level. Near the end of the level, you are going through the second floor offices of this police station. Uh, it's after hours, so all the lights are off. The only lights in the room are coming from the desk monitors. So these police officers are, you know, clacking away at the keyboards, but they don't even realize that Sam is there. You are actually a ghost going around in that environment. It was interesting how the player could interact with the environment in very dynamic ways. Yeah, and Sam had the stealth meter, which let you know your visibility, which changed based on the lighting in the environment. And then in Chaos Theory, you also had the yeah, audio yeah. meter, right? So you could tell how much sound you're making, and it would be affected by other things in the environment, like the sound of engines, which you, again, could turn on and off and affect those things. Right, and the player could also understand the sound that they were creating while navigating through uh, the environment. 
And today, with Spinosaur Remake, we can use a lot more of the rendering and processing power to create some really, really, really compelling and detailed settings and also spend some of that processing power towards our AI processing between you know, the different AI archetypes as well. We're going to have to try to simulate you know, the different kind of behaviors and reactions and ways of moving. Obviously, a special forces soldier will be better trained. They're going to you know, breach differently or kind of enter rooms differently to something like just a regular security guard would, for example. And with Snowdrop, we now have the tools to be able to produce some of this stuff, right? We have uh, advanced lighting in the form of ray trace global illumination, which gives you much more realistic lighting effects, like light transference from different objects onto different materials. And on the audio side, we can also have much better audio simulations. We can have audio occlusion where uh, the sounds will get absorbed by different material types. You can have sound bouncing through a window to you around in the corridor. So a much more realistic audio setting as well. Yeah, we can really improve the AI engagement, right? Like how they are reacting, what they're reacting to. And with all of that, we can make improvements to the cat and mouse gameplay between Sam and the enemies, right? Especially with our enemies behaving like trained professionals. With Spinner Cell Remake, animation is a big focus for us. Some of those interrogations back in the day with the, you know, the, the facial animation, there's a lot we can obviously do 20 years uh, in the future yeah, from that. A lot has well. changed since then. So obviously animation is an area of tech as well. We can really, really push for a game like Spinner Cell. What does Sam look like? What does he you know, feel like when he's moving uh, in these environments, when he's taking cover, when he's kind of crouching under things, doing the pipe movements or the, the split jumps or the takedowns or the interrogations? There's so much in there that relies on the animation quality and that tech-driven kind of animation system uh, just making you feel like you're in that space and you know, part of that experience. Yeah, and we have the capability to really dive deep on that animation now on the tech side. The animation is definitely uh, one of those big focuses that the original games did so well. We want to do that justice. No question, my favorite Splinter Cell thus far is Chaos Theory. I gave it a 9.9 .9 out of 10 for official Xbox magazine back in 2005, which remains and will forever be the highest score that we ever gave a game on the 100 point scale. You had this gorgeous, stunning sandbox campaign with Sam, with all these memorable missions like the bank, like Shanghai, the New York apartment, so many different cool settings to sneak around in. It was amazing sound, stunning graphics on the original Xbox, just an unbelievable game. The level design in the original Spinner Cell obviously was a little bit more kind of linear uh, in the beginning and then over the course of the franchise, you know, it tended to open up a little bit more. Right. Uh, you could see the evolution of the level design over the franchise. So you compare, say, in the original Splinter Cell, the police station level, the police streets. The player's kind of navigating, you know, through these tight corridors, through this very designer-oriented path, going up a ladder, up a scaffolding, down a zip line, through a vent, all to go forward. The player rarely had options on how to proceed. In Chaos Theory, there's the bank level, one of the mm, most favorite levels. Level, yeah. yeah, my favorite level in the Splinter Cell franchise. Uh, there are multiple ways to enter the level and there are multiple ways to proceed through the bank itself. You're doing this heist, uh, you need to sneak in. There's just security guards that are kind of like patrolling around uh, through the night. And you can either bust through the front door with, you know, guns blazing, or you can kind of go around the side, get up to the rooftop and do this really cool repel into the bank there's lobby. a lot of options there as well, right? Exactly. And it just gives the player this breadth of options to proceed through this non-linear layout. Yeah, and obviously Splinter Cell is not an open world simulation or anything like that. And, you know, we need to make sure that we're providing, uh, you know, the right experience Right, we want to bring back uh, those level design principles from cast theory to yeah. the original Splinter Cell. Absolutely. Yeah. The Bank from Splinter Cell Chaos Theory, one of the most legendary missions that's probably the first mission that a lot of people, myself included, think of when they think of Chaos Theory. Just the, the million different ways in and out and around that level and that mission just so memorable. Definitely stealth action redefined. The original Splinter Cell 
really embrace that like ghost play style, right? Thank that you, idea that you're not just going around shooting, you know, every enemy in the face, leaving a ton of bodies around. It was more about making sure that you're completely subjective in a very professional way where the enemy barely even knows you've ever been there. And that really speaks to the fantasy of the character and also the organization, right? The original Splinter Cell was about the formation of Third Echelon. And they're an organization that is solving really complex global problems, but no one should ever know they were there. I think sense of mastery also, if we're talking about perfectionism in the game, is something that's really important. We even would like for the remake to take that a step further. We would like to make sure that the entire game, playable from beginning to end, without a single kill, uh, if at all possible. So that's something that's important for us as well. And by the way, I do just want to point out I have not 100%ed Bathhouse. Um, just for the record, I am sorry, I will work on it and I will do better. <laughs> it's a very hard level. <laughs> it, it is a very hard level. It's almost like a, it's a, it's a benchmark, I think, in many ways. And a lot of that comes together in the original Splinter Cell's like alarm state system, right? This was meant to like test the player and really show what their progress in the mission. But it was a bit harsh. The first alarm would, you know, the enemies would start wearing vests. The second alarm, they'd start having helmets on. And then if you if you mess up three times, the mission just yeah. instantly fails. Like Lambert would be like, good Lord, Fisher, what are you doing, Sam? My God, Fisher, have you gone insane? The mission's over. We want to scale that back a bit in the remake. And we want to give the, the player a few more opportunities to de-escalate some of those situations, right? Obviously, stealth is an extremely important pillar for us, and we aim to incorporate modern design philosophies, improving the minute-to-minute -minute stealth gameplay that was so special in the original. So Sam being the ultimate covert field agent, he has an enormous array of tools and, and abilities, gadgets, and movements at his disposal. And you know, with all of those, they aim to create these, these moments of tension by, you know, you know that there's an enemy nearby, you know that there's a threat coming around the corner, and he has these tools in his kind of toolbox that he can use to react to that stuff at a split second. You know, if there's an enemy that's coming kind of around the corner that you didn't spot in time, you know, he can do these split jumps, get up high and kind of, you know, avoid contact. Um, he can, you know, plan ahead by by looking under doorways and kind of using these tools to kind of understand where the threats and, and that sort of things are. So we want to create these moments of tension that the player will need to use those tools and gadgets to react to. Because of the gameplay and because of the mechanics and the environmental design, you felt like you were there. So you have these moments where you're like, I'm hiding behind a desk and some guy's walking down the aisle toward me and you're just like, you're nervous, right? Because even though you're Sam Fisher, right? You have tools, you're, you can take people out, you're strong, but because you're, you're like hiding in the shadows and you don't wanna be found, you don't wanna make noise, you don't wanna alert the other guards, uh, you don't want them to shoot at you. Uh, it just creates this really awesome cat and mouse tension that you haven't seen in any games like that before. We have some exciting things coming up as well with Splinter Cell. Uh, there's an animated series that's being worked on with our friends at Netflix, as well as the remake itself, which of course we know because we're all working on that, which is pretty cool. It's not simply a remaster, it's being built from the ground up. We get to do you know, all the content from scratch, fresh and ready to go. Yeah, we're aiming to create this top tier remake and push quality as much as possible. This should help us set a good foundation for the franchise going forward. Yeah, we've seen a lot of great posts from the community. We read the open letter that was on the subreddit. Uh, we see all of the other posts on the various socials and it's really energizing us to keep going. And obviously with a remake um, 20 years later, we can look back at um, you know, the plot uh, the characters and the, you know, the overall story of the original game, make some improvements, um, things that might not have aged particularly well, um, small things, but the core of the story, the core of the experience will remain as it was in the original game. And we've also been exploring new and innovative tech and ideas, uh, as well as features and elements from the other Splinter Cell titles. We're very early in production. We're still prototyping. We don't want to rush anything. We want to make sure that we absolutely nail the game. We actually do everything in the right way and produce an absolutely stellar quality experience. And we will be going dark for a little while so we can focus on making the absolute best game possible. So that wraps it up for us. Thank you for joining, and thank you to our industry friends, Ryan, Dan, and Major Nelson as well. 
I want to wish one of my favorite franchises ever, Splinter Cell, a happy 20th anniversary. Thank you, Ubisoft and Sam Fisher, for all the amazing, stealthy memories. I'm excited to see what you have in store for us. I've got my night vision goggles and I'm ready to go. Thanks again for having me participate and happy 20th anniversary to Splinter Cell.